Hey, welcome to the gathering place and welcome to the broadcast. I'm glad to have you with us in this fiery season. And, um, you know, it's, it's interesting. It was, I think it was last year, there were some fires that were, they were like judgments in Southern California. Like God was saying, I'm judging the darkness. And I believe that is happening. But I don't believe that this is the same. I don't feel the same way. And interestingly, uh, Kat Kerr was just here, and she was talking about the weather and speaking to the weather. And so I know that I know that all of you were doing just that. I know that I was, and praying about it. And um, and the winds did subside; they did come down. And um, when I walked out today, I could still smell the smoke, but there was the skies were clear. As we were driving over into Simi Valley, the skies were clear except the haze down toward the east end because God doesn't like that end as much but um <laughs> but what I'd like to go ahead and do is I would like to just just pray this prayer um over our our beautiful state of California especially southern California so if you just pray this with me I take power, I take power. over all the power of the enemy that's trying to control Southern California. Where I live, that is my realm. I will not tolerate the enemy. So I command you, host of heaven, to go to every region where there are fires and pull down every stronghold of Satan. No matter how they're operating, shred every platform over these territories that hell has been operating from. I command you to go right now, pull down the strongholds, shred the platforms, crush the plans of the enemy, throw the demonic into a dry place, and release the life of God into all of this region that I may live in the presence of God that my neighbors may be free from the enemy. Go, host of heaven, and get it done. Amen. Amen. Today I want to talk about, um, actually kind of want to do a little bit of a follow-up from last week. Last week, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and literally a prophet's anointing for finances came on me. And last week's teaching was an anointing for finances, but it was a prophet's mantle, not a prophetic mantle. And there are people that God had me prophesy to, one of whom received almost an immediate miracle, like a $10,000 miracle. But we'll share that later. Um, so I want to I wanna go into that a little bit more today, and um, if for whatever reason you could not make it last week, listen to it, because if there's any kind of a poverty mentality, it will just, it will just drive it out of you, I promise, just because scripture after scripture, it will just drive your wrong thinking out, and um, I like this, somebody told me this this morning, I won't say their name, unless they throw something at me, say, no, it was me, um, something they've been dealing with in their body a long time this last week I must have said something funny which I think I say funny things all the time and it's really easy because when I look at you you're also funny looking <laughs> it's just not, just not that hard um, you know, I said something funny and they, they, they just started laughing they go I hope it didn't bother you the laughing you go, but when I was laughing I got healed isn't that nice so uh, I, I love that. I love that God's going to heal all kinds of different ways. Now, today I want to talk about obedience and finances. Um, it will not be legalistic, I promise. Because legalism just makes you go, darn, these are all things I'm not doing. This is why my life's a mess. It doesn't give you hope. But the number one key to financial blessings are obedience. Obedience. Um, is connected to faith. To obey, you have to have faith. And to have faith, you've got to have God's voice. 
Now we have God's written word and we can stand on that. But isn't it nice when God speaks to us? When the Holy Spirit speaks to us and then we obey. That's what happened to the, to the one lady last week. God spoke to her, she obeyed, and then he immediately spoke again. Um, so faith is obedience to the voice of God. The voice of God is God's grace. And then it's just a matter of receiving the blessings. And some of you may not believe this, but there are many of you that are going to be stepping into realms of blessings that you never anticipated, didn't expect, and couldn't see coming. So it's coming. Isaiah 119, which is the simplest scripture, says this. If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. Well, eat the good of the land? Wouldn't that mean live in the good of the land? Drive the good of the land? I mean, why drive a 30-year-old clunker when you could drive a new car with all the safety features. You know, it used to be that it was used to be was a, a, it's really smart to drive a car for a long, long time. But nowadays, three years after all the safety features and all the modifications, they're so much better. It's just smarter. You know, I, I do a lot of long drives, and it's, it's really nice. I have that little thing on my mirror. If, I, if, if a, a car's coming up close to me, it's blinking. If I put my blinkers on, it's letting me know there's a car next to me, which I go over anyways, but because <laughs> I'm usually going past them. So um, more so in the left lane <coughs> and, and looking at them like, why are you driving so slow? But it, it lets you know when somebody's there, whereas, you know, old technology doesn't let you know that. Why, well, Bob, I can't afford to drive a new car. No, it's not about affording. It's about the blessing of the Lord. The Lord wants to bless you, and he wants to do it in an easy way. He doesn't want you to have to work for it all the days of your life. Listen, in the garden, he told Adam, he said, because, he said, the earth is cursed for your sake or because of you. He said, now you're going to eat by the sweat of your face. But the blood of Jesus all the beatings that he took in the face. It wasn't just his back or his hands or his feet. He took thorns on his head because the Bible said in the garden that the earth would produce thorns and thistles. So he took the curse of the thorns and thistles in his head. He took the curse of the sweat of the face, having his face punched, having his beard pulled out so that that curse would no longer be on us. And I realize we're not an agrarian society, you know, where we're farming and everything, but God can bless us in the society we're in because he's not limited. Now Isaac, and, and you, may, you may not think of Isaac and obedience, but Isaac um, was an interesting character in that he was extremely prosperous because of his obedience to God in a time of famine. In Genesis 26, well, nobody, there's no excitement for this at all, is there? <laughs> it's like, we're like, we don't care about finances, Bob. I mean, our houses could burn down tomorrow. I realize that. Um, <laughs> because we know people whose houses have burned down in this fire. So we realize your house could burn down. That's why it says lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth. But God wants to bless you while you're on earth and use those blessings. And hopefully you win lots of souls. In Genesis 26, verse 1, it says, There was a famine in the land beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines, unto Gerar, and the Lord appeared unto him and said, Go not down into Egypt, because there was a famine. He was going to go to Egypt. He said, Don't go there. He says, Dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of. So he's saying, I'm not telling you right now, but don't go here. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with thee and will bless thee. So in the time of famine, God's telling him to do something that seems contrary to maybe wisdom. For unto thee and unto thy seed will I give all these countries, and I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham thy father, and I will make thy seed multiply as the stars of heaven. And I will give unto thy seed all these countries, in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. You know, sometimes God can be annoying in that I want him to say something new every 10 seconds 
But he's saying the same darn thing to Isaac that he said to Abraham. He's like a broken record. You're annoyed at God for being a broken record. No. The point is that when God makes a promise or he's going to do something, he doesn't change his mind. And he'll say it over and over. Sometimes God will make you a promise and years will go by and you'll forget and then something will happen and, and the promise will be reignited or somebody else will say the same thing. You go, oh my God, God spoke that to me five years ago. Because he didn't change his mind. Yeah, but I wasn't faithful and I didn't do this and I didn't do that. And I was, that, <laughs> that's a human condition. God understands that. But when God gives you his word, it's not because you're good, it's because he's good. If you understand that God does something because he's good, not because you're good, that means that he's going to fulfill it even if you're not good. That he, if he told you something, he wants to do it through you, even despite you. Now, if you're on board with him, that's really good. But if you're not always on board with him, he eventually is going to get you to help you. Not like that, not, not Jonah style, hopefully. You know, where he says, go here and preach in Nineveh. I don't think so. So he goes, takes a ship and gets thrown in the water, eaten by a large fish, and taken and thrown up on the land. That's a pretty supernatural story. And uh, that's a hard way to be pushed into obedience. Well, we're in the time of grace, so God's not going to push you that way. But God, despite your unrighteousness consciousness and self-condemnation, God is able to blow past that because of his love for you and because of who he is, he keeps his word. And when he gives a word to you, he wants to keep it to you because he loves you and because he's God and because of who he is. So despite your imperfections, he wants to bring it to pass. So when there's a part of you going, I really want this to happen, you know, and then, then you become way discouraged. There you go, well, it's never going to happen. Then it comes back to you. That's the goodness of God, except now your attitude may be a little bit different. You're like, well, yeah, I, I'm glad to have it, but I'm not raging for it. So, he tells Isaac the same thing he told Abraham. And then he says this to him in verse 5. Because that Abraham obeyed my voice. Obedience really is the key to everything. Listen, if these fires don't show you anything, they can show you, you could lose everything in a heartbeat. But what can you, what, what can you do? You can obey God. Because eventually you'll have a new body, there'll be a new heaven, there'll be a new earth. You'll have, a, you'll have a mansion in heaven. The things that are here are temporal. Still we need them, but they are, they are temporal. So what can we really do? We can obey God. And you've never, I say you've never, you, you were not there those thousands of years ago when God was talking to Abraham. You probably don't even know what he looks like. But you know who he is? Why? Because he obeyed God. He is one of the great men of the kingdom ever or ever will be because he obeyed God's voice. Not because he was so great, but because he was great at obeying. He said, he kept my charge and my commandments, my statutes and my laws. So, so Isaac dwelt in Gerar. Then verse 12, it says this. Then Isaac sowed in that land. What land? The land that God showed him. The land that was in Egypt. In the time of famine, he sowed in that land and received in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. So Isaac received a hundredfold because God blessed him. Why did he bless him? Because he was obedient. So... Grace, that's what God says. What God said to you. That's grace. That's why, you know, that's why we want to hear the voice of God because the voice of God is grace. But it's really the voice of the Holy Spirit. You know, we're not getting a lot of, you know, 
necessarily thus saith the Lord, or words of knowledge or words of wisdom per se, but God is speaking to us as children, and a lot of times he's leading us by his spirit. So the obedience isn't just for a spoken word from God, but the leading of the spirit or an image or something that God is showing you. Obedience, well, let's put it this way. Faith is your obedience. It says in Romans that by grace are you saved through faith. So without grace, you can't have the faith. But when you have the grace, which is the voice of God, now you can have the faith, which is obedience. So I can't obey what God's not telling me. Now some people, they, they have something in their, their human nature they want to do so bad. And so they, they, they don't hear the voice of God, but they make it up that they do because they want to do it. God may not want them to do it because it's hurtful to them. Now, usually things that you want to do, God has given you a grace for those things. They're just some people, they're just, they're just musicians. They're just what they are. It's within them. They love it. And that's a grace. That's a gift. Now, Kim, Kim was an amazing musician. He had signed a contract before he got saved. But as he was dying there, overdosing, having been stabbed, and a man walked there and picked him up and said, Jesus sent me to get you and took him to the hospital and he got saved. And he stepped out of his contract and he stopped being a professional musician. And then he wanted to be a musician for Christ. On uh, the first thing that he did, he, he was going to a very big church. He was doing this concert, and he went to start playing, and all of a sudden he got up and he started prophesying to everybody. Because God did give him the gift of music, and the, the older he got, the more he used it. But he needed him to be a prophet. And uh, so that part of him, he had to put it on hold a little bit. So there are parts of us that God has, and they're passions of ours. Sometimes they're put on hold for a little while. Sometimes we're, we have to marry Leah before we can marry Rachel. Rachel may be more beautiful, but Leah produced more children. <laughs> you know, Leah, has, Leah brings more to the table. And interestingly, Leah wasn't the one that when they left their father's house hid the idols under her camel. That was Rachel. Rachel the thought. So Isaac put the last part here and that is you just you just receive. God gives you grace, you obey, you receive. Well that means we have to hear the voice of God, yes, but God is speaking. He spoke to, to, there could have been more that I don't remember, but three people very distinctly last week. It was amazing. So Isaac sows the land. He receives a hundredfold. The Lord blessed him. He said, the man waxed great and went forward and grew until he became very great. For he had possession of flocks and possession of herds and a great store of servants. And the Philistines envied him. So even though there was a famine, he prospered because God spoke to him and he obeyed. Now, with Abraham and Lot, they were together, Genesis 13, and they had so much stuff together, both of them, that they decided to, there was strife between the herdsmen. You know, and what they should have done is just settle the dispute, but they didn't. And so they separated ways. And Abraham said to Lot, whatever, if you want this land, I'll go that way. If you want to go that way, I'll go this way. So whatever way you want to go, he goes, I'll do the other. So 
Lot looked and Lot saw the best land. So rather than giving the best land to Abraham, he took it for himself. And Abraham took the other. <laughs> and, um, but it didn't matter. It didn't matter if Abraham had the best land or the worst land. Because in the end, Abraham was the one that prospered and Lot ended up losing everything. His blessing had been tied into Abraham. He would have been smart to stay with Abraham, although when he separated from Abraham, God spoke to him because I'm sure Abraham believed Lot would be his heir. He loved Lot. I mean, they must have had a very close relationship because when he left his father's house, when he left a modern city, Ur of the Chaldees, Lot was the one that went with him. So he must have had a very close relationship with Lot. But when they separated ways, Lot ended up losing everything, and Abraham became richer and richer. And it didn't matter that he took the lesser land or maybe not as good a plot. It sometimes doesn't matter if you're perfect or if every decision you make is perfect or you negotiate the best deal. You can negotiate the worst deal, and God comes in there and makes it better. The thing is, a lot of us trust in human nature instead of God. It didn't matter that he had the worst land. You may not have the best job. Doesn't matter. God can prosper you. He prospered Abraham. Now, Abraham had his own business, which, of course, is helpful. Um, so let's look at Peter for a minute. Are you with me so far? Okay. So in Luke 5, verse 1, it said, It came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God. This is Jesus. He stood by the lake of Gennesaret. He saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them. And they were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's. And he prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. Is it interesting he didn't go into the temple and talk to one of the Pharisees or the scribes? He went and found a businessman. Isn't that kind of what God did for America? He went and found a businessman. And he thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now when he left speaking, he said unto Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a drought. And Simon answering, said unto him, Master, we have toiled all night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. So Peter is a fisherman. Jesus is a carpenter. Carpenters really shouldn't be telling fishermen how to fish. They could tell them how to sand a cabinet, but not how to fish. Fishermen tell carpenters how to fish. And you don't fish in the middle of the day. Anybody knows anything about fishing? You don't fish in the middle of the day. You fish in the early morning when the fish can't see the lines and the hooks and everything. And for them, they had nets. So when you're fishing with nets, you're fishing at night so the fish can't see the nets and they get caught up in them. But in the day, they can see them so they don't get caught up in them. But Peter said, nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. He goes, okay. What you're saying does not make any sense, but I'm going to do it. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net break, and they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships, so they began to sink. When Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him at the drought of fishes which they had taken. <laughs> he recognized the man was greater than what they had taken. A lot of people have been like, Oh, forget Warren Buffett, I'll take the million dollars. You know, they could have been, Oh, thank you, Jesus, we'll see you later. Man, this is, this, this is good, we're good for a couple weeks now. But Peter recognized the greatness of the man over what he had. Unfortunately, when you talk anything about finances or anything in, the, in the, the body of Christ, people separate God from the finances. Or they use God to get the finances. But they don't connect with God and then recognize that finances are a blessing that come along with the relationship with God. They just come along with the relationship. Are you with me? Okay. Let's look at Jacob for a minute. 
You guys aren't getting bored, are you? Um, I'm not yelling and screaming, but but I think we're saying some good things. So Genesis 30, verse 36, and he set three days' journey between himself and Jacob, and Jacob fed the rest of Laban's flocks. And Jacob took him rods of green poplar and of hazel and of chestnut and piled white strakes in them and made the white appear, which was in the rods. And he set the rods which he had piled before the flocks in the gutters and the watering troughs, and the flocks came to drink, that they should conceive. And when they came to drink, and the flocks conceived before the rods and brought forth cattle, ring straight, speckled, and spotted. And Jacob did separate the lambs and set the faces of the flocks toward the ring straight and all the brown in the flock of Laban. And he put his own flocks by themselves, and he put them not into Laban's cattle. And it came to pass, whensoever the stronger cattle did conceive, that Jacob laid the rods before the eyes of the cattle in the gutter. That means that every time they were going to drink and he saw the stronger ones coming, he'd put those things in there. And, um, but when the cattle were feeble, he put them not in. So when he saw, oh, they're not so good, he took the rods out. So the feebler were Laban's and the stronger Jacob's. And the man increased exceedingly and had much cattle and maid servants and men servants and camels and asses. So he's working for his father-in-law who's continually cheating him. Finally, he goes into business for himself. And, and really, honestly, if you have a sense for it, if you can go into business for yourself, it's always going to be better for you. But God had showed him, and we'll read that in a minute, and, and he took these things and he put them in the troughs. Whenever the strong cattle came in, uh, they, they were breeding and then when the weak cattle were coming in, the ones that weren't as good, he took them out. He didn't put them there, let's just say that. And I don't know if it was some kind of a supernatural thing or if it was something God understood, but it caused them, when they bred, to come out cattle that he needed. And when his father-in-law changed his wages, they came out the other way. So there was some kind of genetic manipulation going on back in the days when they didn't even have microscopes. And he was the one that was doing it. So let's look at the 31st chapter of Genesis. The sixth verse, he says, And you know that with all my power I served your father, and your father hath conceived or hath deceived me and changed my wages ten times. But God suffered him not to hurt me. If he said, Thus the speckle shall be thy wages, then all the cattle bear speckled and if he said thus the ring strake shall be the higher then bear all the cattle ring strake thus God has taken away the cattle of your father and given them to me now doesn't the Bible say that in Genesis thirteen twenty two, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children and the wealth of sinners laid up for the just well let's say he took all the fat all the cattle so here here was Laban Jacob was the man that had the covenant with God He's cheated him 10 times in his wages. So that would be an unjust. So God was giving the wealth of the unjust to the just. But he was right there with the unjust. <laughs> now, Christians can be some whiny people. And I don't mean they're drinking it. The other kind of wine. And sometimes they don't recognize that God has positioned them somewhere like, like Jacob to take the wealth of the sinner. Sometimes God positions you in a place, and, and today it would be maybe a little different, that he positions you there to be a witness. You know, I work for the most horrible person. And you may be the sweetest person, but that, that might be that you're the only one that can get them saved. That's why you're there. No, I want to complain about it. All right, complain to the TV or to your dog, but be, keep being sweet to them. Trust the Lord. You might be the only one that can get them saved. But then, also, you may be the one that ends up inheriting the business. Or they say, I want to sell the business, and I'll, I won't even take any money. I'm just going to give it over. You give me so much. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of ways the wealth of sinner can be laid up for the just. 
but usually it's with somebody you're connected with. It's not just accidental. Oh, yeah, some guy came and, and he, he parked in front of my house and came and knocked on my door and said, man, I've been a terrible sinner. Or, or said, I, I tried to find a hotel. I couldn't find one. Can I stay here? And then he had a million dollars in his suitcase. And he dropped over and died. And it was there, so I took it. That's really not how the wealth of the sinner comes to the just. Now, sometimes in the Bible, the armies of God would go in there and they would win a battle or God would win the battle for them. And then they, you know, they go and they'd collect the spoils. But in this case, it was his own father-in-law and he took the wealth of his father-in-law who was a sinner and he was the just. You with me? It says in verse 11, And the angel of God spake unto me in a dream, saying, Jacob, and I said, Here am I. And he said, Lift up now thine eyes and see all the rams which sleep upon the cattle are ring straight, speckled, and grizzled. For I have seen all that Laban doeth unto thee. I am the God of Bethel, where thou anointest the pillar, and where thou vowest to vow unto me. Now arise, get thee out of this land, and return unto the land and to thy kindred. So now he has divine direction. God saw the unjustness. Everything given over. And so Isaac, we know that Abraham was very rich. Cattle, silver and gold. Isaac, we just read that story, reaps a hundredfold because of his obedience to God. And Jacob, they all become extremely wealthy. Bob, I don't, I don't even care about being wealthy. I just, I just want to be able to pay my bills and things like that, drive a nice car, whatever. And uh, maybe you're not greedy. But God doesn't mind you having wealth as long as wealth doesn't have you. So I want to look at what I like to call the law versus the spirit as far as wealth. Now, how many of you would say that when we think about Jesus, people really don't think about him as a wealthy man, right? He's a carpenter. You know, he didn't grow up with the most wealth. But anything he needed was there. Right? So, I want to look at the law versus the spirit as far as, as, far as wealth goes. Now, Joshua 1, 7 and 8, God speaks to Joshua, who's taken the reins from Moses to lead the children of Israel said, only be thou strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law. Now, should we do according to all the law? No, we're not supposed to. But, but look, look what he tells him. Which Moses, my servant, commanded thee, turn not from it for the right hand or the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. So he's telling him, if you obey the law that I've given you, you're going to prosper wherever you go. The eighth verse, this book of law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. Thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein, for then shalt thou make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Now, I don't know where people got the idea that God is a God of poverty. Because everywhere in the Bible it talks about blessings. The blessings are either related to physical, financial, blessings in your family, it's always something that's good. It's never destructive. God's not out there putting poverty on people and saying, isn't this wonderful? It has nothing to do with blessing. And he's saying, if you follow this book of law, goes, you'll not only have prosperity, but you'll have good success. And I don't believe it was just him, but the whole nation. He says, you'll have prosperity, you'll have good success. Now, I, I think that anybody would agree that the Jewish people as a whole around the earth are possibly the wealthiest people on the earth. And there are probably more lawyers that are Jewish than maybe any other race, you know, per capita. Maybe not more overall, but why is that? Because they grew up under the law. So they're naturally good at the law. Came from that. But that was the old system. Now let's look at the new a little bit. And this will go over, and you're going to go, Bob, I can't believe you're going over Corinthians again. But stay with me because it meshes into some of the other things we're saying. 
for whatever reason, these last two weeks, God has been releasing a spirit of prosperity. Now, as a whole, I don't like to talk about finances that much because people get so weird about it. But when God speaks to me to speak about it, then I do it. And um, I know you're okay with it because of what happened to you. That was awesome. Everybody's going, who? Well, if you were here, you would have known. <laughs> Anyways, so in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 3, he says, um, Who also has made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. The letter of the law. But if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, was glorious, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? So I, I know we know this, and I won't write the whole thing down. But we know in the old, you have the law. In the new, you have the Spirit. The law, of course, condemnation, the new, and, as well as righteousness. So he said the, the, the ministry of the Spirit is going to be more glorious. For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more does the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had not glory and respect by reason of the glory that excels. In other words, if they prospered, and we just read what God told Joshua, if they prospered under the law and that was part of the glory, I mean, listen, part of the glory was, you think about Moses, he stood in the presence of God, and the light that was on God came onto his body. To the point, they said, put a veil over your face. We can't look at you. Why couldn't they look at you? Why couldn't they look at him? Because that light, they were not under grace. That light made them feel condemnation. Now, Jesus, when he came, he was obviously greater than Moses, but he wasn't shining like Moses because he didn't bring the light of condemnation. Even though it had a glory, he brought something different. So if you prosper under the law, it would be, it seems to me that it would be much more under the Spirit and under righteousness. But the Spirit is not a thing. It's not a set of rules or even principles. The Spirit is a person. So when, now Jesus, he's obviously not the Spirit, but he says to Peter, drop your nets in the middle of the day. Drop some. They get loaded. So he's obeying a person and not a thing, not even a principle, not even his own knowledge as a fisherman. I mean, think about it. Jesus did a lot of weird things with these guys who were really good on the water. They're on the water. They think they're all going to die. He's walking up. Peter said, Lord, if that's you, bid me come. He says, come. So he obeys him. What happens? He walks on the water. But then his fisherman instincts kick in. He's looking all around him, the waves, the wind. His fisherman instincts kick in, what he's good at. And he starts drowning. Jesus wasn't good uh, as a fisherman by profession, being a carpenter, but he was really good at walking on the water, on saving people walking on the water, and then saving the ship and trans relocating it to the other side. But there was another time they were, there were storms and the waves and Jesus was in there sleeping. You know, I hate this about Jesus because I'm like this in certain ways. Sometimes when things are really bad, I just feel really calm and I wonder why everybody's so panicked. I, I mean, it's really the truth. Yeah, and I, I have to catch myself sometimes so that I can relate. The fires are going everywhere like... <sighs> It's the big deal. I mean, it is a big deal. That's the truth. But I feel a bit like Jesus. Like, let me take a nap. <laughs> I mean, they were, they, were, they were in serious trouble. Why? Because they were attacking, I, I believe, the, you know, Satan, of course, by this time, he knows who Jesus is because he whipped him. So he's trying to, you know, maybe sink the boat with Jesus on it. And Jesus is in there taking a nap. He's tired, man. He's, got a busy, he's a busy guy. So he goes out there and he stills the, the waves and the seas.
I love that about Jesus and hate it at the same time because I just don't feel connected sometimes. When there's earthquakes, I feel happy and I'm praising God. Of course, I prosper every time there's an earthquake. But <laughs> why? Because the wealth of sinners laid up for the just. Earthquakes are one way that the wealth of sinners laid up for the just. All right, I won't go into that. It's too many. Okay, so let's read down a little bit. It says, in verse 17, it says, Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. That's why there's liberty in America. If you want to get rid of liberty in America, you have to get rid of God. That's what a lot of, a lot of people right now, there is a political side that is godless. And they don't want God. They want the, if the government says, we're going to take care of you, they're saying, we're going to be God to you. you. You can't trust in the government. You have to trust in God. But if you trust in the government, they will take care of you, just not the way you think they will. The only time you have liberty is where the Spirit of the Lord is. Now, in China, there are a lot of Christians being raised up. God's raising up a lot of amazing Christians over there. And you see things going on in Hong Kong. You think that God is just going to let those people be under that tyranny forever? The same in North Korea. They're going to be under that tyranny forever? The same in Cuba. They're going to be that, under that tyranny forever? You know, we had dear friends, a couple of different people that went into Cuba. You know, under that communism. You know, communism is so good. <laughs> it works so well. And it's such a great form of government. Um, yeah, no, Bob, just socialism is okay. It's okay if America has all the armies that protect you and we pay for them, then it's okay. But if you start taking away all those American armies and you have to pay for your own armies, socialism doesn't work all that well. I believe that God is going to bring liberty to all of these places. No, Bob, it's the end of time and any crisis is coming. No, we still have time. And I believe that Christ is that seed that's going to spread more and more throughout all the earth. And America was raised up by God, and America is infecting the earth. And I've been all around the world, and I'm telling you this right now. Everybody wants to be America. And how do you be America? You have to take God. Because God is what makes America great. In God we trust. The Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. We all with open face, it really should read unveiled face, not veiled as the, as the Jewish people had been. Beholding is in a glass, the King James says, but it's really a mirror. The glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So, over here, you prosper. Over here, you become. What does that mean? Well, it means that most believers are following a legalistic system to get money or to get finances so they can retire and then die. <laughs> but that's the old. In the new, it's not a law or a principle. In the new, it's a person. Not just any person, the greatest person, the Holy Ghost. It's the greatest person who Jesus said will be with you forever. He will never leave you. The greatest person and righteousness which is the foundation of the throne of God, righteousness, which comes by grace. We don't have to go into that a hundred more times because we will do that a hundred thousand more times in the future. But the righteousness which comes by grace is a free gift, but it's given to you, so is the Holy Spirit. So why did God give us the Holy Spirit? So we could follow the old nature, so we could follow the law, or we could follow Him. Wouldn't you rather be led by the guy who knows where they're going? You know, I realize with the GPSs, you can go everywhere with the GPS. Before they came out, Randy right here, he was the GPS. <laughs> if I had to go somewhere that I didn't really know where it was, and I'd say, what's the best route at this time of the day? Because he knew the best route at this time, this time, and this time. 
because he traveled the freeway so much. He says, well, at that time, you need to go this route, and it'll take this much time. And so, so you know, that's how, that's how you would get your route planning. You know, now we have, now we have the GPS. But the Holy Ghost is our spiritual GPS. You know, we should be tying into him all the time. Like Randy was, Randy was the GPS. It's a person. Holy Spirit's a person. He is your GPS, your spiritual GPS. And it's not that he's leading you to prosperity, but he is prosperity. God is blessing. God is abundance. I mean, Jesus proved that everywhere he went. He was abundance. He gave up everything and humbled himself to be a carpenter, but he was abundance on the earth. Need wine? No problem. Need to feed uh, 15,000 people? No problem. Oh, business isn't doing that well? Go throw your nets out. No problem. Need to pay the temple tax? Hey, take the day off. Go fishing. The first fish you catch. You know, a lot of guys like, you know, just throwing their, their uh, hook in the water and fish. It says, hey, the first one, the goal will be in that mouse, and just enjoy the rest of it. Jesus was prosperity. I mean, he was of, of the highest order. If you were sick and you got near him, you got healed. If you were dead and you got near him, you got resurrected. He was the ultimate prosperity in every way. So what he's saying here is, in the old, they had a system of law, which brought both condemnation and death, but it had a glory about it. But in the new, we have the spirit and we have righteousness, and by that, we can look into the mirror of the glory of the Lord. And that's, that's actually the Lord Jesus. How do you look at him? Through the Holy Spirit. We become changed into the same image. So your destiny and really what you're called to do is to look just like Jesus. Not kind of like him, not a little bit like him, not partially like him. Because we're not around Christ, we're in Christ. We are the body of Christ. God looks at you as he looks at the son. He's the head, we're the body. We're one with him. God looks at us exactly the same as him. Now, I know that's hard to comprehend because we feel condemnation all the time. We feel our own weaknesses. We look at ourselves and, well, I'm not good at this. I don't do this. And I da 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 uh, You can get in condemnation over eating the wrong diet. Uh, you can get in condemnation over, over buying the wrong thing. You can get in condemnation over a thousand things. But Jesus did not give you that gift. He gave you a different gift. And the gift is his spirit and his righteousness so you could look just like him. Paul said we become transformed into the same image. We look into what image? Him. And we become transformed into what? Him. That means we have to think differently about our finances even. This is a little bit difficult because we're taught certain financial things all the time. I remember a friend of mine was doing some financial planning classes at UCLA and I went and I did some with him because as a pastor some of the things that people most wanted to counsel with you about was their finances and so I did a lot of personal studying on it but then I decided to take some some professional classes on it and I was I felt my spirit within me was grieved when I was when I went to take those classes but I did it anyways why because every once in a while I just have to be disobedient right I mean, I'm not standing up here saying, yes, I obey every whim of the Holy Spirit. I, I'd like to, but I don't always. <laughs> Why don't you always, Bob? Sometimes you're just too darn lazy. It's like, I don't feel like it. You know, it's like when you, when you come home from a trip. I learned because I used to travel a lot. The best thing to do when you come home from a trip is to unpack immediately. Otherwise, your bag's there for two weeks. It's the same thing with obeying the Spirit. Obey the Spirit immediately. I think, am I out of time? I think I have a couple more minutes. I better hurry up. Okay. 
Galatians. Before we read Galatians, the Old Testament, they had prosperity. In the New Testament, we become prosperity. Galatians 5, verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. What was that? The law. Or sin. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify that every man uh, that is circumcised, he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. Now Joshua was under the law. We are not under the law. We are under grace. He said, Whoever, whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. We are on under grace. That is what we are under. We are not under the law. We are under grace. By grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, as any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So we're under grace, not for bad works, but that grace actually transforms us to become more like him, and we actually begin to do the works that he does more almost by accident. It's our nature. It's a nature transformation. That's what the communion is all about. It's transformation of nature. Except you eat my flesh and drink my blood. What is that? My DNA. Except you take, partake of my divine nature. Verse 5. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision avails anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which works by love. I'm going to skip down a little bit to the 16th verse. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. These are contrary one to another, so you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now under the law, they prospered by meditating on the law day and night. But under the Spirit, we would do something completely different, wouldn't we? Under the Spirit, we would not prosper by following the law under the spirit we would prosper by obeying the holy spirit so we are living in a different financial arena or even times that things that don't make perfect financial sense make perfect financial sense because the spirit said it romans eight fourteen. i know you know this but let's just say it anyways for as many as are led by the spirit of god they are the sons of god Let's just turn that around. For as many as are sons of God, they're led by the Spirit of God. Now, John 14, because I'm, I'm, I'm going really fast because I'm really out of time. John 14, verse 16 says, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it sees him not, neither knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and shall be in you. John 16, verse 12 through 14. I have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you, guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you, show you things to come. The spirit guides you and shows you. Paul said we're led by the spirit. But he also guides you and he shows you what the future, things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and he shall show it unto you. That's the Spirit. He show you, show you, show you things to come. Obedience in the New Testament times, in the time of grace, obedience is the true key to kingdom prosperity. Oh, Bob, I, I want a Corvette or something like that. Okay. I've been praying for five years. God hasn't given me a Corvette. How many ticks do you have in those five years? Ten? What were they for? Speeding? <laughs> How many think you had if you had a Corvette? Would you even be alive if you had a Corvette? You know, sometimes God keeps things from you 
that will hurt you until you're ready for them. And it's not he's not holding them back, but he doesn't, he doesn't want to let you hurt yourself. I like that about God. Obedience, let me tell this story. I was going to read out of Matthew 6, but I just don't think I'll have the time. I'll tell you a couple stories. I'll tell you a story we had happen last week. So, many years ago, when Kim Clement was first coming to our church, it was around 1993. And the Holy Spirit <clears throat> spoke to me. Now, we were paying. We had a lot of people on staff. We were paying all the expenses, um, the hotels, the airfares, everything. And, um, but the, and the services were packed. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me on the Wednesday and said, I want you to give the Wednesday offering to Kim because that was the offering that we would take that would help us with the expenses. And he said, I want you to give that to Kim. And he said, I also I want you to give him $500 personally. So, okay. I talked to my wife. She says, oh, I feel we're supposed to give him $500 too. So that's good because we agree. <laughs> so that night, we're in the office talking. And we'd already become, we'd already become really good friends really fast. And I said, Kim, I said, um, tonight for the offering, I said, we're supposed to take it for, for the ministry, for your ministry. He goes, oh, Bob, you can't do that. He goes, you know, you need that for the expenses. And I said, I said, I know. I said, but I said, oh, that's what the Lord told me. No, Bob, you need it. I said, come on, you're a prophet. And you're going to challenge me on hearing the voice of God. <laughs> um, so he, he fought me a little bit, but then he said, okay, if you really feel, I said, I really feel like God spoke to me about this. So, so he did. So uh, received the offering, gave him the $500. Come Monday, we had no ability to pay anybody <laughs> and other expenses. Now, Nora, who was sitting right there, will verify everything I'm selling you is 100% truth because she's the one that was, she was in the middle of it. And um, which prophets, by the way, some prophets can be very enigmatic. He would change 15 things every week. So after he was coming so much, I just, I just told Nora, remember, I said, I said, don't change anything until the last day. Then <laughs> anything he hasn't changed, because he'll probably change it all back, and then, then we do everything on the last day. So that worked out pretty well. We didn't end up doing things like three and four times. Anyways, we did that. We didn't have any money. And um, we get a check in the mail for $5,000 for the church. So we were able to pay people to do things. <clears throat> and um, you know, back then, 5000 is a little bit more than it is now. But we had bigger needs then. And this man that sent us the money, he was a financial man. He was a brilliant financial man. And um, he was praying. He was on his knees praying. And an angel of the Lord openly came into his room. Now, I know that we see things from the eyes of understanding. You can see angels and, and hear very accurate things. I know that. But he had an open vision. And his son told me, he said, my dad's never had anything like that. The hair stood up on the back of his neck. He was scared to death. And so would you be, trust me. <clears throat> and the angel kind of came in from the side. The angel boldly, you know, angels are not, they're not timid, boldly said, Give my prophet $5,000. And um, he knew that Kim was either going to be in town or was in town. He wasn't sure. And um, the angel then, the angel came around and came up to him. And he said, Bob, the angel looked just like you. Now, back then I had long curly hair. And, you know, even more muscular than these days. And, and I was a little more like like ready for, you know, confrontation. And he said, he looked just like you. He looked like he was ready to fight, <laughs> like he was going to fight him. And he goes, and he said, I knew that I had to give you the $5,000. So I guess I was the prophet that day. Um, 
So we got the money back. We had an incredible angelic encounter. But more than that, Kim began coming to our church twice a month for almost 10 years. And then even when we were going out, it was our, whole, our church was on. We were out all the ushers. Even when we went over to the den, all the people from our church. And we stayed connected with them. And I worked with them. I'm still on the board then over all those years. What did it do? The obedience brought the pathetic into that church. Now, there were other churches that were bigger. We could barely see 500 people. There were churches that were bigger, that had better resources. But a lot of them were still from the prophet. You'd get bigger offerings coming to our church. That church is three times our size. Why did you steal? Because you don't steal from God's prophets. Why would you do that? That would be just ridiculous. But that obedience opened the door. And then somebody gave me a check for $500 as well. So it all worked out very nicely, don't you think? I'll tell you one last story because I am completely out of time. And then we'll receive the offering and see what else God wants to do. Uh, so last week, I had a prophet's anointing that just was on me for finance. It wasn't a prophetic anointing, but it was a prophet's anointing. Now, as you know, I'm more, my thing is more for healing, but there are times that the prophets anointing for finances will come, especially when you focus on God's righteousness. And so, the Holy Spirit had me begin to give the word to you, and here's the funny thing, I kept pointing, calling her, and she's looking down, she has her glass on, she's looking down, I said, no you, look up, lift up your head, <laughs> I'm trying to give her a word from God about finances. But she's not, she won't look up. Finally, she looked up. But she texted me later. I don't want to say your name. I don't want to be trying to borrow money from you. She texted me later, and I'll just read part of the text. I won't, I'll keep the names out. Bob. You know, today as I was telling you, her husband and I already uh, had planned on giving $40. But the Spirit, uh, she says, after I walked into church, I felt to give more. Well, I needed to pay my rent and so forth. But she needed to pay her rent, but she felt to give more. So she felt to give more. She was texting her husband, I feel to give more. Because God spoke to her and she was immediately obeying it, he actually almost immediately gave her a word. I was in the middle of teaching. It wasn't like it was at the end of the meeting and we we're just following the Spirit and calling things out. It was immediate. Like, like I was in the middle of teaching and he gave you the word while I was still teaching. And so she sent me, sent me this text and with it was a check in there. She was put on a Sunday. Somebody brought it for almost $10,000. That's so why I'm not telling you names. I don't want you to run to go borrow money. I'm pretty sure that helped pay the rent. Isn't that nice? That's so sweet. So there were a couple other amazing stories, but I'm completely out of time. And I, I, I just love that one because it was so immediate. So um, we're going to receive the offering while we're still online, while we're still doing the broadcast. So those of you that are watching, and I do want to pray something over you, but those of you that are watching, um, if you want to give, just go to the computer and where it says give, give. Those of you that are here, you want to text it in, it's up there. If you're writing out a check to the gathering place, or some of you that do it to Soaring Ministries, um, plus we have envelopes in the seats if you need them. If you don't know what to do, just raise your hand. One of the ushers will help you. And then we'll pray over the offering and see what the Spirit wants to do. I know I did not feel very animated today or preachy or anything like that. I just really felt I was just talking to you today. Maybe that's the best way sometimes to talk about things like this. Um, but I, I could feel 
the spirit on it. I could feel the authority in what I was saying. And it's the kind of authority that releases blessing. Stacy, the Holy Spirit wants to tell you if you'll obey him in even the littlest things, he will start to speak bigger things and he will set the course of your life. This isn't just finances, but he will set the course of your life, including your finances. And opportunities, opportunities will come. It could be employment, it could be other things. They will come that will be open doors to much greater prosperity than you thought you could have, than you thought you deserved. Sometimes there's a condemning spirit that speaks into your ear about who you're not. But God's Holy Spirit wants to tell you who you are, how much he loves you, how great you are in his eyes. The gifts and the calling that he has placed within you, they don't ever die, and they're there let them come out, but it starts with the simplest of obedience. And the simple obediences will lead. Abraham had to leave Ur of the Chaldees. He had to do that one obedience before God could speak to him again. He says, go to a land I will show you. But he couldn't go. If he didn't go, God couldn't have showed him the land. So God will give you obediences. And if you're uncertain, he'll send somebody to confirm it to you. Does this make sense to you? Uh, Jennifer's answering for you. <laughs> so maybe you guys have been talking, but there it is. So, all right, are we ready to receive the offering? Let's pray. Let's pray this with me. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for loving me so much. Thank you for being my high priest. I come to you as a high priest. I bring my tithe or my offering to you right now. And I ask you, Jesus, to receive it as Melchizedek received from Abraham. And as my high priest, sanctify it, make it perfect, make it beautiful, present it unto my Father as something that's sweet and wonderful. And Lord, out of that obedience, I receive the release of the righteousness that comes from the king of righteousness. I receive it into my finances. I receive it into my life. I receive it into my household. I receive that righteousness into the state of California and into this nation. Thank you for it. Amen. All right, go ahead, ushers, and receive the offering. For those of you that are watching, I'll just I'll say I bless you, and um, I pray that God's grace and his righteousness would be with you. Listen, if you, don't have, if you didn't listen to last week, please listen to it. There are words that God gave us about what he's doing financially, and it's the kind of word that if you will listen to it, accept it, <clears throat> it will give you the wisdom to act correctly for the future. Because we are in a time and a season of abundance and prosperity, and it's going to be for a season... If in that season you are not wise, you will take the prosperity and spend it rather than paying off debts and saving it. That's what you do. When, when abundance is there, pay off debts, you save. And then when there's not abundance, you go in and you buy everything for pennies on the dollar. That's my advice today. God bless. We'll see you next week. Amen.